This is the Mark series, part 21, and this is the passage in Mark where Jesus feeds the 5,000. This actually miracle of feeding the 5,000 is the only miracle of Jesus aside from the resurrection that's in all four Gospels. That kind of puts a spotlight on it, doesn't it? And this miracle is actually really significant. We're going to get into some theology and some apologetics, and we're going to talk about what this miracle says about who Jesus is. And I'm telling you, I'm going to hammer this point home as we're going through Mark, that Mark is revealing who Jesus is through the miracles and the statements of Jesus Christ without commentary very much. Usually he just gives you what Jesus does and you're supposed to work it out. Mark presents a mystery, talks about the mystery, and, but he gives you the tools to understand what this mystery is. That's kind of how it seems Mark is working. I'll get more into that later though. For now, let's start in verse 30 of Mark chapter 6. The apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. What is this? What's the context in case you weren't with us in the previous weeks or previous studies? Jesus sent the 12 out two by two. They go out two by two into towns and cities around Galilee, and they are preaching all over the place. And this causes Jesus' name to be known so much more. Then we get this break where it talks about the death of Herod and how Herod, or excuse me, the death of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod and how Herod was thinking, is this Jesus John brought back? You know, because he's hearing rumors of Christ. Um, Then in verse 30, we come back to the disciples. So we had the sending out of the 12, then we had the death of John, then we then we have the coming back of the 12. You can tell that this there's this story of John the Baptist is sandwiched, eh, Mark and sandwich again, sandwiched in between the sending out of the 12 and the return of the 12. In verse 30, they return. What are they returning for? This is the debrief. This is the debrief. They've gone out two by two, and now they're coming back to Jesus to talk to him about what happened when they went out. They're going to maybe have questions for him. Maybe they just want to tell him what happened. And so that's what they do. They report to him all that they had done and taught so that um, the disciples here are also refining their understanding of the doctrines and teachings of Christ so that later when they relate these to others, they will have not only heard them, but you know when when you have to tell the teacher back to the teacher what you think they said? Then you find out if you really understood it, right? And they're doing this with Christ. So they're better understanding Jesus so they can better communicate his truth to us. They heal, they cast out demons, they did all this stuff. And this is in this verse, Mark 6.30, it's the first time they're called apostles in the gospel of Mark, which is interesting. Now, earlier we had that, that same root word, apostolo, used of the apostles, but they were, it wasn't the term apostles. It was rather... Jesus gathered them that they might be with him and that he might send them out. That was when he first called the 12. And that word comes to the root word, Greek apostolo, same Greek word. But this is the first time it's used like a name, the apostles. Why? Because they've just finally been sent out. So you're not just an apostle because you're called to be one. You are because you're doing it. And there's an element, I don't know, maybe there's something hinting there about people who are like, well, I'm a teacher. When's the last time you taught? (laughs) You're You're not really teaching anything to anybody. Then you're not really much of a teacher right now. You have an ability, but you're not expressing it. And so it might be encouragement to us to use our abilities, but that's kind of a side note. Um, Mark and sandwich. Let's talk about this Mark and sandwich. Step one, and by the way, just for those who haven't been following in the series uh, going through Mark, Mark and sandwiches is where Mark starts a story, interrupts it with a different story, and then finishes his story. And he seems to do this because you're supposed to use this structure of these different stories to interpret each other. Like there's a point being made in the way it's structured. And so um, here we are, this market sandwich in step one was the sending out of the 12. That's the top piece of the bread on the sandwich. The sending out of the 12, they make Jesus known to who? To Herod, ultimately. He ends up being found out, uh, he finds out about Jesus. And the point here um, seems to be make Jesus known. I know that sounds like really Sunday school, but... It's true. And the point for us is to recognize that it's our responsibility to make Jesus known. Jesus' name was known to Herod, not simply through the works of Jesus, but through the works the disciples did in the name of Jesus. And we're the name bearers of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And when we see that it is our task and our duty to make Christ known to the world, it changes our posture towards the world. I see myself as a light, not trying to blend in, but actually trying to stand out and represent Christ. So the fame of Christ, in a very real sense, is in the hands of believers. The fame of Christ is in the hands of believers. Now, we have the Holy Spirit enabling us and helping us, but I want us to feel that sense of, not anxiety, that sense of calling 
to step out and share Christ. But there may be another element here of why this sandwich happens, how you have the, they go out, then, then we Herod hears and the death of John, and then they come back. And the other reason might be this, um, that they're trying, that Mark's trying to relate to them, to us, that there is a danger in being sent. Here they go out, finally being sent. They don't have Jesus directly with them. And the next thing that happens is John is murdered. At least we're reminded of John's murder. But that's the choice moment to remind us of how John was killed. John's imprisonment and death is an example in the, in the Gospel of Mark of Jesus' death, how he ends up being mistreated and killed as well. But it's also an example of how the disciples themselves, the apostles, will be imprisoned and killed as well. This is kind of a big deal. This is why later we'll get to Mark 8, 34, where Jesus says, <clears throat> if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And we'll talk about the significance of that. It's a cross. Like a cross is like a torture device. Jesus says this before he goes to the cross. So they would have been puzzling on it until they saw him at, on the cross and they would have thought back and said, wow, we have to lose our lives to follow Christ in this world. Lose our lives, not just our reputations or something. So the idea here, I think, with John being sandwiched in between the disciples going out and coming back, his death is to tell us that there's risk in following Christ. That's the point. There's incredible risk in following Christ, and the attitude of a Christian should be, okay, let's do it. This is kind of a big ask. It is a big ask for us as Christians that our call is to lay our lives down and follow Jesus Christ, even if it kills us. But I would say, maybe you think, oh, I'll die for Christ, but maybe you should be asking yourself a question like, well, what if I just suffer for him a little bit? Will I do that? Will I, I mean, I'll die for him, but will I suffer for him a little bit? What if I, I don't get invited to events because of people know I'm an outspoken Christian? What if my family starts planning stuff and not telling me about it? That happen to anybody? You don't have to, you don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff where it's like, it doesn't feel like persecution, perhaps, and I don't know if I would call it persecution exactly here, but what I would call it is the cost of following Christ. And I would say it's something our attitude should be, go for it, accept it, count the cost, and follow Jesus anyways. Because the Christian attitude towards persecution is that I'm following my Savior in his suffering and into glory. And that's I'm following him in these things. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4 puts it this way. For you have died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. I mean, just think about the meaning of those words. Like, you, you're already dead. And your real life, it's hidden in Christ. It means it's secure. And when he's revealed, you'll be revealed in glory. Meaning that I see my entire existence on this earth as missional. I'm on a mission to proclaim the truth of Christ to glorify God in this world, to live for him. And the life that I'm waiting for, the life that I'm living for, is ultimately on hold. And I'm waiting for it in that future time. So that all of this stuff is stuff I'm willing to sacrifice for that ultimate thing. The New Testament, ultimately, over and over again, I won't go through all the scriptures today because it would take all day, it prepares us not for prosperity, but for persecution. Have you noticed that? For every prosperity verse that some prosperity preacher can rip out of context in the scripture, I can give you two persecution verses in context. I say that while smiling, but, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's fun or something to smile about even, but it's something to rejoice in in a deeper sense. And just to recognize this, we are called to, in fact, Jesus put it this way, don't be afraid of people who can only kill your body. Small beings. They can only kill your body. That's all they can do. Have no fear of them. Those are powerful words. Powerful words. And we're not like no fear like an army running out to slaughter their enemies. No. We're no fear as we go out preaching like lambs to the slaughter. We're going to bring the light of Christ to people, whether it costs us our lives or not. And I remember hearing a discussion one time between our, our senior pastor, hearing about a discussion, our senior pastor and a Muslim man who was very upset with him as he was trying to um, bring the gospel to Muslims. And the man says to him, um, you preach the gospel to me. I, I know this sounds weird, but this is what the guy told him. You preach the gospel to me, I convert, I kill you. And 
that was he, he was basically saying, you know, I'll I'll kill you if you convert Muslims. I think was actually his point. And then Pastor Gary looked at him and said, "Well, that's the difference between me and you. You'll kill for your beliefs, and I will die for mine." And that's the Christian attitude towards persecution: is that I look at it and I say, "I'm not trying to get persecuted. I'm not, tr- you know, it's not one of those things where it's it's like in uh, some sports, you know, what I'm talking about some sports." where a guy just walks close to someone else and the guy just suddenly flies backward onto the ground and he's grabbing his back or his knee or something like looking for a foul point. Like Christians can't be like this. We're not trying to pretend we're being wounded, but we're willing to die for Christ. Why? Because there is glory to come, because there are treasures in heaven and because we're in this world, but not of this world, because we really want people to know Jesus. And we do live in a PC culture that has caused us perhaps in some ways to silence ourselves as a way of avoiding disapproval. So the worst censorship I think currently going on in the free world of Christians is self-censorship. We hold back our own tongues. We hold back our own truth that we can share with the world, our own knowledge of the truth of Christ. So just to, just to put this in your mind, that the New Testament's preparing Christians along with the disciples, the apostles, along with the example of John and the example of Christ, to face persecution with no fear because we are living for an ultimate kingdom that's bigger and better than this world. And we want to remember that. Verse 31, Mark 6, 31 says, And he said to them, Jesus' response to the disciples after they explained to him what they had done, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Not even to eat. Okay, they were very, very busy with ministry, proper ministry, like right ministry, called of, of Jesus to do this stuff. But have you noticed this, those of you who serve in ministry, that ministry is really different. It's a very different experience for those who were serving in ministry versus those who were being served by ministry. It's a very different experience. Not that it's good for one and bad for the other. They're just different experiences. It's good on both sides, but radically different. When you're receiving and you're the one being ministered to, you're filled up and you're encouraged and you're edified and you're like, don't even stop, keep going, do it again, go longer. Why can't it just, oh, just stay here and keep soaking this up? But when you're the one serving, you're the one, in a sense, pouring out. And so you're tired. When other people are, you know, their, their flame is stoked, you, you need more fuel. And that's just the natural consequence of this one serving versus the one being served. I know at, um, at camp, we would take students to camp every year, and they would look at us as the leaders, the counselors, and, and, and they would think, you're so lucky. You're so fortunate. And no, I don't believe in some weird, ooky luck thing. I'm just using the word. Okay, you're so fortunate because you get to go to camp all the time. And I'm telling you, my wife will tell you, every year before camp, I'd be like, camp's coming. <laughs> it's coming, man. I'm excited for the ministry. I'm not excited for the bunk beds. I'm not excited <laughs> that I can't sleep in my bed and I have no fridge. Where's my fridge, you know? But it was more than that. It was just the constant pouring out into others that you just, you get tired. And that's natural. Even a, a pastor who's teaching, who gets up on Sunday morning and he, and he, and he preaches and someone's like, he's got the easiest job in the world. And we're like, well, that's easy to say because you don't have any clue about what that job entails. Um, and, and if it is that easy, they're probably not doing it very well. <laughs> My own opinion. It's, it should be something that drains you. Your fellow laborers with Christ, the scripture says. It's a labor. It's a labor. So the disciples were drained. They come to Jesus after they've done this two-by-two two thing, casting out demons, healing. They've done all this stuff. And then Jesus is like, come away to a secluded place. Be alone in a secluded place. This doesn't mean they weren't excited. It just seems to imply that they're tired and drained. Their resources are running dry in some sense. So Jesus calls them away. Um, I imagine they were still excited. They cast out demons in the name of Christ. They, they did stuff they were watching Jesus do, and now they're doing it. So that, that seems like it'd be very exciting. It'd be rewarding. It's fruit in other people's lives, like Philippians 4.1, and Paul says that the Philippians are his joy and his crown. So he rejoices in them. He sees it as labor, he, he, you know, but he rejoices in them. Also, ministry, while it's draining, it's incredibly character shaping. So I don't want you to think it's one sided. It's just a different kind of ministry to the person. When I'm serving in ministry, I'm not learning the same way that those I'm serving are learning. I'm often learning different lessons in different ways. 
It's and it's very character shaping. I, I don't want to even think of what kind of spiritual maturity I would have if I hadn't spent years and years of doing of ministry, doing ministry, serving. If I hadn't done that, I feel like my growth would have just been stunted because there's so many things you, you grow in as you serve. Everyone should try to serve, whether it's in the church or outside the church, try to find ways to serve others um, in the name of Christ and you'll be growing a lot. So, but they're drained and they're hungry and their needs have been set aside while they were ministering to others. And it's probably not the Sabbath. Jesus isn't like, come away and rest because it's the Sabbath for a couple of reasons. One, they always mention when it's the Sabbath. Plus, he didn't have to tell you to come away and rest if it's the Sabbath. Like that's just, so this is like an extra pause in their schedule. And I find this encouraging because I'm the guy who, who's like, you know, I've got my work week down to 60 hours. I feel like I'm doing pretty good. Um, everyone's different, but that's, you know, to me, 60 hours is like a lot better than it was a few months ago. Okay. So I'm like, that's, I get this. And he encourages, he encourages me by taking them aside and says, here, you need to rest. You need to rest. So are you too busy? Are you too busy? Maybe you need to rest. And maybe you're thinking, but Mike, I have so many important things to do. I mean, think of how important the disciples' ministry was. Is there a ministry that's more important than that that you can think of? And yet he tells them to take a break. That's really encouraging to me. Because I don't want to be lazy, but man, sometimes I need to slow down a little bit and take a little rest. So if they can come, a, come and rest a while, then you can too. And Christ gives us a precedent. And that's the point here. Jesus gives us a precedent that you do need to take care of yourself. Um, if it helps so that you won't become selfish in this, don't think of it as take care of you, do you, put yourself first, that kind of selfish, er almost arrogant kind of way that our world often talks about this stuff. But instead, think of it as this. You have a responsibility to take care of yourself. Are you fulfilling that responsibility? Think of it as a duty to God. You know, I have a, you know, I have a responsibility to uh, take care of my car and take it in for oil changes. It's not just because I love my car so much. It's like I'm responsible for this thing. I need to take care of it. And so maybe you need your oil changed. I don't know what the application of that would be, but you could try that. Um, so think of it as a responsibility. Um, and maybe one way to ask yourself this, if you're doing too much and you're too busy and you're tired and you're, you feel like older than you are because you're just tired, you know? It's just that. It's just you're drained. Um, is ask yourself this, am I having diminished capacities and diminished results? To me, this has been a trigger. Just, this is just practical wisdom for what it's worth. Take it and think about it. Chew on it. When I notice that my ability to serve and minister uh, or do the things that I'm supposed to do is diminishing because I'm overworking myself, that is a big red flag that says I need to slow down. Time to take something off the plate. Time to let something just not get done so that I can slow down and recharge my batteries because I can't keep going at this pace. You, we, we're running a marathon, not a sprint. And you have to ask yourself as you're, if you've ever exercised long distance, you have to ask yourself, this pace is nice, but can I keep it up for this long? That's the question, and that's the question you have to ask yourself. Do you have diminished capacities? If you do, diminished results, then perhaps you need to slow down. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to overreact to this and um, stop caring for other people. And we'll talk about that in a second because their rest actually gets interrupted. Jesus is like, come away and rest, and then they don't really get to very well. They might, maybe they got some rest when they get in the boat and they travel, but sh sure enough, when they arrive at the shore, the people are following them. And then they may get some level of rest because as we'll see, it seems like Jesus is the one who teaches the crowds now. So maybe the disciples were able to just sit down and just like, uh, you know, vegetate for a second. I don't know. We don't know what they were doing at that time, but we'll read in verse 32. <clears throat> they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. That was the goal, seclusion. The people saw them going, and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Now, here's what blows me away. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on. You guys are overworked. Let's get you away where you can, oh, the people are following. What trips me out is Jesus isn't annoyed by the people. Now, it doesn't trip me out like I'm surprised Jesus isn't annoyed. It just... I realized it's not my natural person to be. Like if after the study and then I go home and I'm like, I got to edit video for the next you know, three hours and just be doing that. And you all ran to my house. 
and met me there and were like, we want to hear more. I might be a little annoyed. <laughs> like, I'm just being honest. I might be a little bit annoyed, to be completely frank with you. Not that that's good, but that, that would be my reaction. And we can be annoyed because here's the, here's the trap. We, um, we sometimes can be focused so much on others' needs that we're not taking care of ourselves in a response, not a selfish way, but a responsible way. But at other times, what happens is, as my needs increase, my focus on my needs also increases. I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm, I'm just want to take a vacation or go move out of the country or something, you know, and you're feeling those things. It's at that same point where you start caring less about other people. That's the temptation, to start caring less about others. And so I want to say on one hand, take care of yourself. That seems to be a principle here, a precedent Jesus gives. On the other hand, they come and he sees their needs and he goes and meets their needs. Because guess what? Even though maybe there's a, a tiredness that's going on, Jesus examples for them see the needs of other people still. So even though you're tired, do you see their needs? Do you see them as people who have needs? That, that seems pretty significant to me. Don't stop caring about others because you're going through hard times. That's the example that we're getting. And that's powerful. That's good wisdom. Perhaps this gives us a balance then. So my needs are important in a sense of responsibility before God but so are other people's needs still important. And I want to be taking care of both of those things and not sacrifice one for the other, if at all possible. God give us wisdom how to play that out in our lives. Now, I want to talk for a second about what triggered Jesus' compassion, because this is a word used of Jesus primarily of God in the, in the New Testament, this, word, this type of word for compassion. And he has compassion on them. Um, what triggered it? Well, it says in uh, verse 34 that he was compassionate towards them because they're like sheep that have no shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And this has some interesting connotations to it that you get when you do some theology stuff that I think you might enjoy tonight. I enjoyed it. First, let me say this. They, it's not like these guys had no leaders, right? They had leaders in their lives. But you might say the leaders they had weren't like shepherds. Because here's the people, they're like sheep without a shepherd. So while they had plenty of rabbis, and they had the Pharisees, and they had the Sadducees, and they had whole st organized structures. I mean, religion is throughout and saturating their culture. They're not being brought to God in a healthy way through these people. These leaders aren't really shepherds, and there may be a lesson for us in helping others to know and follow God, and not just, I want to be careful how I say this, but not to just learn my rules for your life. Right? But, the, but now Christianity has lots of rules. I don't want to pretend like, we don't have rules, just a relationship. And I'll be like, well, ask any marriage if their relationship entails rules. <laughs> right? There's rules in this relationship because it's a healthy one. There's, of course, there's rules. So there's rules in Christianity, but there's a relationship at the core of it. It's all feeding the relationship. It's all centered around a relationship between you and God Almighty, a holy, loving, perfect, righteous God. So here's the Old Testament connection with this phrase. There were sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. Frequently in the Old Testament, this term, being sheep without a shepherd, comes up when the people of Israel are lacking good or godly leadership. And I'll give you one example. It's when Moses, at the turn of, of generations, when Moses is going to pass off the scene, and they're about to enter the promised land under Joshua. They're about to enter the promised land under Joshua. Joshua is about to be appointed. And this is the context November, uh, in Numbers, 27 verse 17, it says, who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. And the who here is Joshua. So Moses is stepping off the scene and Joshua, which is the same name as Jesus actually in the Old Testament, Yeshua, Yeshua. So you have this, this second figure who's coming in after Moses to lead the people in. Moses can lead them up to the promised land. Jesus leads them in or Yeshua leads him in, and I think there's all this picture of Christ that's here. And there's more to it than that, though, because Jesus in the scriptures is the prophet like Moses. Who's the prophet like Moses? Well, this is like an, how do I put this? Um, in Jewish thinking, this is like an eschatological character, meaning he's a guy who comes at some time in, in, in their perspective in the future or perhaps the present, he shows up and he's fulfilling a promise of the Old Testament. And this person is the prophet like Moses. We hear about it in Deuteronomy 18. When Moses tells them, hey, I'm going to leave, but God will, will raise up a prophet from among your brethren. So he'll be Jewish, and he'll be a prophet, and he'll be like me. 
and he will lead you out. Now, some um, modern rabbis, they will interpret this to mean, oh, every prophet that ever came after Moses fulfilled this role, right? Joshua was the next guy. He, he's the guy who, you know, gets raised up. But yet when you read on in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, three verses later, it says, and this is with Joshua, Joshua has been raised up. Between verses 15 and 18, Joshua was raised up. But in verse 18, it says, and no prophet has arisen yet. So it's commentary that there is a prophet like Moses, not Joshua, somebody else, some future character, and he hasn't come yet. I wonder when he'll come. So it wasn't Joshua. Excuse me, that's uh, Deuteronomy 34.10. Excuse me, I gave you the wrong reference. Deuteronomy 34.10, where it says it wasn't Joshua. There was no prophet risen yet. So the people in Israel's time, or in Jesus' time in Israel, were looking for that prophet like Moses. This is why in John 1.21, when they're asking John, who are you? They ask him, are you the prophet? Not a prophet, the prophet. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? No. Well, this is this prophet like Moses. We also get this in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which is these, this uh, predates Christ, this, con this, this writing, and it talks about how there's like a prophet like Moses who's supposed to show up and they're waiting on him. The New Testament repeatedly affirms that it's Jesus in Acts 3. I won't go there, but I'll give you the reference. Acts 3.22 Verse, verse 22 through verse 26, it talks about how Jesus is the prophet like Moses, and he's the fulfillment of that passage in Deuteronomy. In Acts 7.37, it says the same thing. Now, here's where we get deeper context, because what's about to happen is the feeding of the 5,000, right? And after the feeding of the 5,000, which we read about in the Gospel of John as well, here's how the crowd responds in John 6.14. When they see Jesus feeds the 5,000, what is this all about? It says, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, truly, this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Not a prophet, but a specific prophet, singular, who was prophesied in the Old Testament. This is him. He's a prophet like Moses. Why? Because he just multiplied the bread to feed the masses. Remember when Moses gave us the manna? And so, yeah, total um, affirmation of who Jesus is here. So John 7.40 also affirms that they do it again in John 7.40 where they say that he is the prophet who is to come into the world. And why in that case in John 7.40? It's because Jesus just gave them the living waters. He said, I'll, I'm the, I, I will give you living water. Moses gave you the water out of the rock. I'll give you living water. So he's not only li like Moses, he's better because of what he's going to give you. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But the idea here is that phrase, sheep without a shepherd, in the context of Deuteronomy, in the context of the feeding of the 5,000, it all is feeding into the idea that Jesus is the greater than Moses guy that's going to show up. And it's telling you who Christ is because it's what Mark's miracles are about. It's about the identity of Jesus. So how does Jesus deal with the fact that they're sheep without a shepherd? He teaches them. We read about it here. It says, so he began to teach them many things. Jesus just starts teaching them. And here's where I think a lot of people would be bothered nowadays. Wait, these, these people, ha people have needs, Jesus, and you're just going to teach him? I remember hearing, I can't tell you how many times from people in ministry, they're like, what we don't need is another Bible study. I don't know if you've heard this before. Hopefully you haven't, <laughs> but I have. And I just thought, something's wrong with these people. <laughs> what we don't need is another Bible study. We, maybe we need better Bible studies. I would agree with that. But don't tell me we don't need another Bible study. Um, the teaching of the people meets their need because they're without a shepherd. Because in teaching, we're leading people to God. We're shepherding them to God. And I, I've, I believe in the power of teaching scripture and how it just transforms lives. And I teach assuming that that just works. How do I know? Well, it's worked in my life. And scripture tells me that it has this effect upon us. We read about like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You can be equipped for every good work just by hearing the word of God taught truly and carefully and understanding it well. That's pretty powerful. So scripture is good. I, this is what I teach, by the way. I don't have, like, new, my own personal teachings. I love, just love Mike's teachings that Mike came up with. I don't, you wouldn't be here if that was what I was doing. It's the power is in the, the truth of God's word, and so we communicate that. So I think it's good for us to recognize this as we're ministering to people and want to shepherd them to God, that they need to be taught God's words and God's truth. And I don't want to use the word of God as a launch pad to get into my own issues, my own things. 
And sometimes this happens perhaps in churches where pastors get stuck on the idea that they have to do topical messages every Sunday. And so then they, have to, they do a series on six weeks on marriage and then five weeks on business and then seven weeks on family and then three weeks on marriage and then three more weeks on business and then eight weeks on family and then they got to do another marriage one because I don't know what else to do, right? Because it, it, it's just, I'm not going to the text to say what is scripture like, what if I just teach and it just glorifies God and puts on display how great God is, and you walk, you walk out just knowing that much more and refreshed in the goodness of God? Isn't that worth it? I don't know. That changes my life. I think it changes yours. Verse 35, it says, um, when it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it is, and it is already quite late. Send them away, the crowd. Send them away so that they may go into sur the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give him something to eat. <laughs> it was like 12 guys, right? He's like, you give him something to eat. Maybe he had other disciples that were probably following alongside him, not just the 12. But he tells them, you give him something to eat. And I remember they hadn't even had time to eat themselves when they first went away. I don't know if they got some nibbles in there while Jesus was teaching them. We don't know what happened in the interim while Christ was teaching. Maybe they did. So you give him something to eat. Um... Previously, they escaped from the crowd to rest, and now Jesus says, get out there and meet their needs. And sometimes we need a kick in the pants. Uh, my pastor, Pastor Gary, has always been really good for this. <laughs> I remember one time, no, I won't even. <laughs> Let's just say, there's times where I'm like, I don't know if I can do it, and he's like, go do it. <laughs> and sometimes that's exactly the encouragement you need. Get up there and go do it. Go out and serve. Sometimes come away and rest, and sometimes not get out there and serve. And we maybe need to hear both those things, and the Lord knows when we need what. Paul, um, the apostle, he had a really interesting ministry experience of dis... What do I want to say? Disapproval? Uh, disappreciation? Is that a word? How about unrequited love? Maybe I'll put that. It says here in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, look at what Paul says about his ministry with the Corinthians, whom he really did love. He says, I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Paul was willing to give of his resources fully to bless people. So it's not like you, yeah, you can take a rest, but that doesn't mean you don't drain yourself in the service of the Lord. It doesn't mean we have this sort of self-preservation thing. It's more just responsibility. And he says, you know, effectively, the more I love you guys, the less you seem to love me. But look at his attitude in the midst of that. Remember, they were challenging his apostleship. They weren't listening to what his instructions were. There was all kinds of issues going on in the Corinthian church. But yet he says, before he says, oh yeah, the more I love you, the less you love me. He says, I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. Or one translation puts it, spend and be spent. I'll just be spent. I am glad to just be, just be spent out to bless you, to help you, to minister to you, to see you grow. That's a beautiful, beautiful attitude. It's not right the way sometimes we feel unappreciated. Sometimes that's just our own insecurities, really. But um, it maybe isn't right the way that we feel like we're not as rewarded or we're not having as much success as we think we ought to have or whatever it is. But there's this great attitude where we just do it anyways because our reward is with Christ and because our example is Christ who did that. Who did that. If anybody was underappreciated, it was Jesus. Not appreciated till after all of his work was done. I think this may apply to parents and leaders of all kinds, that there's like a, yeah, take care of yourself, but also spend and be spent, you know? Expend yourself for the blessing and ministry you might have to other people. We're just very others-focused. But I don't just want to please you, I want to build you up and bless you. In the world, we want to... The thing about people-pleasing is to realize, I think, that when I'm trying to please others, what I'm really doing is trying to increase my reputation. This isn't even about them. I don't even care about them. I just want my reputation to be exploded. But ministry is the opposite of that, right? Because it's all about building you up and helping you regardless of what you think of me. That's a different attitude. Um, problem, though, is that they have no food for the crowd. Jesus is like, feed them, you take care of them, kick in the pants a little bit. 
and they have no food. Verse 38, it says, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish, five loaves, two fish. And he commanded them all to sit by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, maybe there's like a lesson in this, um, like use what you got, how much you got, just go use it. You bring, you know, he didn't, he could have just manifested food out of nowhere, but he takes what they have as an offering and then uses it. I, um, I think that this could be like an illustration here about use what you've got. I don't think that it can be used properly by prosperity preachers to try to be the example of, see, if you give God your loaves and fishes, he'll, he'll multiply and you'll walk away with baskets full of, and you know, the more you give, the more you get. I don't think that's the heart behind this passage. I think the heart behind this passage is that Jesus is the new Moses. I think that's the heart behind the passage, actually, if we look at it carefully. But using what you've got is nice because you don't have to be special to serve. This is supported by other scriptures. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. It tells us that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And he's speaking here of not only the cross, foolish and weak, but he's also speaking of the Christians, foolish and weak in the eyes of the world. And he's using those things on purpose. God wants to use often weak vessels. We sometimes think like, boy, if so-and-so gets saved, God could just use them so mightily. And maybe that's true. But sometimes it's nice to see some little foolish weakling get saved and see God use them mightily anyways. And that sort of, I think that gives God more glory. So you don't need to be special to serve. You don't need to be specially skilled and things like this, but you do have to be completely offered. That's the requirement. The requirement is I'm completely given over to God. I'm utterly devoted. And this is what I've seen over and over in the years of ministry is those who do well in serving God aren't the gifted frequently, they're the committed. They're just the people who will show up and be there and help out and do it and to the best of their ability. And they just keep doing that time after time after time. And so often gifted people are tempted to be flighty because they're looking for better opportunities because they think they're worth more. And so they end up being half committed. And this is a temptation, I think, for those who are gifted to be half committed and to not stick around in the same place for 10, 20, 40, 80 years. 80 years, that's a long time to be in one ministry, but I don't know, maybe... Maybe. Dodgeball ministry. (laughs) Romans 6.13 puts it this way. It says, And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. The presentation of all of me to just serve the Lord in whatever I'm doing, that's the requirement. It's not, you you don't gift yourself anyways. You just, you don't, you don't do that but you can, you can give yourself to the Lord. Okay, let's talk about green grass. Because in verse 39, it says, he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. On the green grass. Now that would require a lot of grass. Not just a little bit of green grass. This is a significant amount of grass because there's 5,000 men and that doesn't count women and children as we learned from Matthew's account of this passage, which means there could have been 8,000, 10,000, 20,000. We have no idea how big the number might have been, depending on how likely it was they were traveling with their families. We know women and children were there because it says in Matthew that it doesn't count that number. Lots of green grass. Now, Israel kind of has weather a bit like California. In fact, we have a very similar climate to Israel. If you guys have been to Israel, it's very similar to the California climate. Up towards the higher altitudes, you have a lot more cold weather, and then lower down, you have less of that. Um, the... Um, the occurrence of large amounts of green gas, grass, green gas, I don't know, I don't even want to know what that is, um, green grass in the Sea of Galilee is in that area is only going to really happen at certain times of year. And so this in Mark seems to narrow it down to a certain time of year that this sort of event was taking place because it's that weather kind of like California. Well, John 6 verse 4 doesn't tell us anything about green grass, although all the gospels they mention they sat on the grass for some reason, they're all mentioned grass, but Mark calls it green, okay, that really narrows it down. But John 6, 4 tells us when this miracle took place, and it says it took place at the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, that that was a near festival, it was on its way. So now we have a whole new context, and we get it from comparing incidental details from Mark and John, and this is something that is interesting as you read the text of scripture, we often call these undesigned coincidences. 
One of them by themselves is not super significant. It's just interesting. But when you start piling them up over and over and over and over again, you realize that these are real historical accounts, um, which you probably already realized. But this is extra bolsters our, our sort of way of showing others that these are evidential accounts or historical accounts. But there's more than that. So John 6, 4, just this random thing about it being near the Passover time. We also read in 631 of Mark that many were coming and going. Did you notice that? Many were coming and going. And this is like an incidental detail. It, it's not a comment about Jesus's popularity. It's not that many people were following Jesus. It's rather, the story is in Mark, a lot of people were just on the road coming and going. And then they recognized the disciples who had just gone out two by two into all these different cities. seems like Jesus wasn't as recognizable, but a whole group of his disciples, his team, made it a lot easier to spot him. And so they recognize him. There's just a lot of people either journeying or traveling in Israel at the Sea of Galilee at the same time as this green grass is going here. And what did John say it was? Passover time. You see, twice a year, all the males of Israel are supposed to gather together. And of course, they bring their families, if at all possible. And they would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And along the western side of the Sea of Galilee is a Roman road that they would take to get to Jerusalem. So what we're seeing is these, these events, these miracles taking place around the time of Passover. It's confirmed by two different details in Mark that don't make sense by themselves, but they make sense when you read it in light of John. I think that's really interesting. The, the new first century historian Josephus, he said that nearly three million people were in Jerusalem during the Passover during Nero's reign. That's in his Wars of the Jews. That's the name of his book. Um, three million. So we're talking massive numbers of people. So there were many people going to and fro. They were journeying. It's interesting that when Mark says, uh, hey, well, let's send them away to go buy food, they don't say, let's send them home to eat their food because they're from this region. He says, send them away to go buy food because apparently they're, tra they're traveling. They can't just go back home. So again, we have another confirmation of that. I think this is very interesting. So it's incidental corroboration, or speaking of historicity. Now, uh, uh, someone could easily turn to me and, my, and say, Mike, come on. John knew Mark wrote that. So John wrote Passover because he thought it would make more sense of what Mark wrote. And so then I just want to press on that a bit and say, okay, so you're saying John carefully crafted his book so that it would be an incidentally just coinciding and working with the gospel of Mark because John wanted to make sure they worked together perfectly, right? Yeah, why do you say that, Mike? I would like his... In 10 minutes, I guarantee you're going to tell me that John has blatant contradictions where he completely disagrees with Mark and just makes stuff up. And that's what the critics often do. So we will often focus on trying to resolve contradictions, but this leaves us in our apologetics, our defense of the Gospels. It leaves us in a weak position because we spend all day proving accusations wrong when we can actually bring a whole other case of, through undesigned coincidences to show that these are real historical accounts. So we've got both of those tools in our toolbox, undesigned coincidences, and resolving supposed contradictions. All right, verse 41. This is, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus did, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and, and uh, kept giving them to the disciples. Notice that, kept giving them, so you get a, a visual of what it looked like, right? He just kept handing over more food to the disciples to set before them, and he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Again, that's not counting women and children, as we read from Matthew. There's that statement, I, I, as I pointed out, he kept giving them. That's a, a, the verb in the Greek actually supports that, that this is like an ongoing, continuous action where he just kept handing out more food. And the highlight is, of course, on Jesus, who it can just supply food to people. Now, there are alternate explanations that people try to come up with uh, for the Gospels and for the miracles that we read about in the Gospels. I don't know if you've heard this kind of stuff before. I'll give you one I heard from, uh, I think it was on the History Channel. And what they did was they, they noticed in John 6, it says where this food actually came from, the five loaves and the two fish. It came from a little boy. We read in John 6, verses 8 and 9. It says, one of the disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? See, the disciples didn't have any food on them for this, but they had this kid. They gathered, where do we have food? And they, okay, and they got some offered. And here's how the liberal 
wants to demythologize scripture and they say, well, I think what happened is, and see if you can figure out what's wrong with this story. I think what happened is people saw this little boy offer all his food, all the food he had, and then they were like struck in their hearts about how selfish they'd been. And so people started pulling food out from their cloaks and they started gathering out all the food they had been hiding, you know. And so the whole crowd of thousands of people brings out all this food and they all eat and they're satisfied and there's 12 baskets left. So it's a miracle of, 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 of like pay it forward compassion. Um, this is what you call, while it's sweet, it's nice, it's what you call ad hoc. Ad hoc is a term that means you made that up. Right? It means you made that up with no evidence. The term ad hoc means non-evidence assumptions, or actually in Latin or whatever, it means for this. I just made it up for that. For that. You know when someone's making up lies and they have to keep spinning a new one to try to back up the, a gap in their lie? That's where ad hoc stuff happens. I think what this does is it just shows what somebody wants to believe. They want to believe Jesus didn't do a real miracle, but they want to like the story of the Bible. Now, if you want to believe the Bible while denying the Bible, that's not going to work. Jesus performed like a, a miracle here. And the way to demythologize it is to assume that miracles don't happen or, and then just make up a story, literally just make up a story that retells what you think might have happened. But that's, that all depends on your assumption that miracles just don't happen or that Jesus couldn't have done such a thing. And that, um, yeah, that's just ad hoc. It's just made up. Um, here's another little side note, interesting thing. The loaves were barley loaves we read about in John. They were barley loaves. Barley bread um, was used especially in the period during the Passover that led up to the Feast of First Fruits because at the Feast of First Fruits, the Pentecost, that's when the wheat harvest would be there and they could have fresh wheat loaves. But the barley harvest comes in earlier in Israel, and so they would have had barley loaves. And so it's just another incidental detail that fits the time and the culture. I mean, how could someone writing supposedly way later who doesn't really know these things just include these little details? It wouldn't be very likely. I also noticed that Jesus blesses the food. Did you notice that? He blessed the food and he broke it. Um, there is an ancient Jewish prayer. Some people think Jesus might have used this. It says the following, uh, Praise be to you, O Lord our God, King of the world, who makes bread to come forth from the earth, and who provides for all that you have created. And now we don't know if Jesus used that exact prayer. Um, he seemed like he might have just prayed his own words, or he may have used a sort of standard prayer. We don't know. Could be anything. But I do think that there's a, a, a precedent here that our Lord did pray over his food, uh, pray over the food, so to speak. He blessed the food. And I think that there's a practice that's healthy for us as Christians. Every time you eat, that you stop and you recognize that God is your provider and you give glory and thanks to him. Um, as a really healthy thing to do every day. Let's talk about the numbers briefly. Um, the numbers, there's five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets left, and we get this in all the Gospels. Drilled into us, five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets left. Five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets left. We get this consistently. And as for the numerology, what the five represents, what the two represents, and what the 12 represent, I just want to say, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I just don't know, okay? And I don't know how, I, I hear lots of theories and you will hear plenty of theories about this stuff and you're welcome to hear them out. But ask yourself when people give you, numbers in the Bible mean this, ask them how do you substantiate that in the Bible? Or are you just telling me what it means? And then when you use that number, say five, two, 12, can you go throughout the text of scripture and see that same element in that number? Now I do think numbers have significance but I don't know how to always answer the question of why that number is in that text, in that exact passage. And this is one of those situations. I will say this, 12 baskets left, there's 12 disciples. You could say there's 12 tribes of Israel. God's providing, you know, Jesus is providing more than enough for all of Israel. Maybe there's an, maybe that's there. I don't know. I, I like it. Is it true? I don't know. I just don't know. It may be ad hoc. <laughs> it may well be. Um, so what I do get out of this though is the disciples were hungry they gave their food away, and they all left with a full basket of food. And I just think that's neat how the Lord provided for them, you know, not only for their meal, but for leftovers too. And so they're getting taken care of, and that, that's sweet. Jesus is taking care of them. Um, 
But these are the kind of details you get from eyewitnesses. You get the, the green grass, you get the groups of hundreds and fifties are separated, you get how many people are there, you get descriptions about how people are going to and fro, you get um, 12 baskets, you get five loaves, two fish. The descriptions are so specific, it's the kind of stuff you get from eyewitnesses. It speaks to the historicity of it. Uh, there's one other major application that I don't want to miss, and I'll just mention it briefly, and that is the idea that they ate and were satisfied of the provision of Jesus. And Jesus himself in the Gospel of John, he relates this, I'll read in a moment, to his own body that is offered for us. He relates his, his, his gifting of this food to them, to him providing his own body as the sacrifice for us. And the idea is Jesus satisfies. He fully satisfies our need for grace, fully satisfies your need for salvation. If you have Jesus, you have enough. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing and sets Christianity apart from every uh, works-based religion out there. So I think in the big picture, it's not about the loaves and the fish. It's about the one who multiplied them for massive numbers of people. And this tells us about who Jesus is as the new Moses. So I'll talk about that briefly now. We'll use the Gospel of John to help support this idea. But first, I want to take you to uh, a parallel passage that I never hear guys teach on that's related to this passage, and it's in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42, and it's about Elisha. Not Elijah with the J, but Elisha with the S-H. Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42, this really short three-verse statement that's something that Elisha did. It says, Now a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God, that's Elisha, bread of the first fruits. That's interesting because this was like the first fruits, wasn't it? It was around the time of Passover, and there was, there was a first fruits offering from the barley harvest that was offered at the same time of Passover. So he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And he said, give them to the people that we may eat. That's what Elisha says. His attendant said, what? Well, I set this before a hundred men, but he said, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he said it before them and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. This is a really similar miracle to Elisha that Jesus is performing, except on a much grander scale, much grander scale. Notice this, Elisha came after Elijah. Elijah is represented by John the Baptist. And so here's another connection that Jesus is the one who comes after Elijah, so to speak. Elijah did a certain, I think it was seven miracles, and Elisha did double the miracles, I think 14, if you actually count them out. So Elisha had like a greater, grander ministry than the other. But this is different than what Jesus does. I mean, Jesus doesn't just do it for hundreds. He does it for thousands. He does it for everybody there. There's thousands upon thousands of people that are there. And so let me read to you this. This is from D.A. Carson in his commentary. Um, he says the following about the history, the culture of the time. He says, toward the end of the third century AD, Rabbi Isaac argued that as the former redeemer caused manna to descend, so will the latter redeemer cause manna to descend. This comes from a non-Christian rabbi in Ecclesiastes Rabbah on Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. It's a commentary on the Old Testament. And what he says here is that the former redeemer, Moses, he brought bread. And guess what? The latter redeemer, the new Moses, he's going to also bring bread. This is something that's here in the consciousness of the Jewish people. And remember, after this miracle in John 6, they said of Jesus... This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. They saw, this, they saw the miracle in the context of it confirming who Jesus was. That's the point in Mark. That's the point in John. That's the point we need to get. Let me read to you the whole section in John. Here's a section. John 6, verse 26 through 36. You don't mind if I read a bunch of scripture? All right, All right let's do that. It says here, Jesus answered them and said, by the way, sorry, this is right after he feeds them. And they chase him and they want more food, right? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Jesus himself, with his own words, he's telling them, there was a lesson in the bread. You didn't get it. You just got the bread. You believe I can do this again. You want more food, but you didn't get the message, the sign. Verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore, 
They said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? And they have an idea for Jesus to confirm who he is. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Hint, hint, Jesus, make more bread. They're just manipulating Jesus to try to get food out of him. There's no real true agenda to gain the eternal life that he's providing. In other words, they want material help from God, but they don't want spiritual transformation. They don't want their lives to be changed by Christ. Verse 32, then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread, the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. (laughs) We never want to have to make food again or something. They, They want the manna experience again, but they're not getting it. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. You do not believe. And then finally, the way that they ultimately respond to Jesus, and this might be why in Mark, this is like the last of Jesus' miracles in that direct area of Galilee where he focused so much of his ministry. Things start to shift in the Gospel of Mark as far as the activity of Christ. He's still in Galilee, but not that region. Not, not you know, Bethsaida, Capernaum, not like that area as much. John 6, 15, when they see this miracle, it says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So they see Jesus. They want him to deliver them from the Romans. They see him as the new Messiah, the, or the Messiah, the, 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 the new Moses, the prophet, but they want to use him for their tasks and their goals, so they just don't get it. And this is what Mark's communicating, what the Gospels are communicating largely is people didn't understand Jesus because they were carnally minded, because they wanted their material lives to be blessed, because they wanted their agendas to be achieved by God, and they didn't see their deep need for a savior, and they didn't take the bread of life, that if they trust in him, they could be forgiven, they could know eternal life, they could have the joy and the hope and the peace that there is in Christ, They just didn't get Jesus, and this is the sad reality of our time as well. How many people, even even in our own culture, will claim that they're Christians? But they're only excited when they think they can claim the name of Jesus for their own personal cause. But can Jesus claim them for his cause? And that's the question I have to ask myself. Am I on board with the glory of God to live for him in this world? I mean, that's a real question I have to ask myself, and I sometimes need to be get redirected and get refocused and remind myself of the glory of the spiritual things and that this, this bread to Jesus was a means to an end and the end was not getting you full. I'm going to feed you this bread, but this is just to teach you about the spiritual life that I will give you. And when they didn't get it, he was like, what a waste. You don't even get it. You don't even get it. You totally missed the point. It's about who I am and about what I will provide you, forgiveness and grace and salvation. Christ, the bread of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread of life. We thank you for the example of Christ, of giving, giving, giving. But of also not being a pushover. Jesus was no pushover. He didn't just do what the crowds wanted. He didn't try to create some version of Christianity that was crowd-pleasing, but rather he gave the truth and called people to live a truly alive, spiritually alive life. May we have the courage to be lights in this world as well, to point people to the resurrected King Jesus, to the bread of life, to the one who takes our sin away and gives us the eternal spiritual blessings that are so much more important than the material things people are so focused on. Lord, we also pray for ourselves that you'd help us to set our hearts um, entirely in heaven and to live in this life with a heavenly mind, that we'd be, we be so focused on your eternal glory and on the eternal kingdom that we could actually be of some use in this temporary world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.